Hi, I'm Tony Todd, and welcome to Throwing Heat. I'm here with my two co-hosts, Dr. Dan Ratner and Ross DeBoss. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, ring the bell for notifications, and click that like button. Today's guest played 16 years of Major League Baseball, and now he's a studio analyst for the world champions, Los Angeles Dodgers. Let's welcome my buddy, Mr. Jerry Harrison, to the house. What's up, Jerry? Tony, what's going on? What's going on, guys? How you guys doing? It's your world, Great man. We're you, just Jerry. living in it. We're just living in it, Jerry. I so, love that world champion Los Angeles Dodgers. I just love that ring to it. That's, that's just cool. uh, that's the ultimate because you know, I'll tell you about it later. But my buddy Ross and I, we were actually there when they won the championship. But my question to you, Jerry, you basically come from baseball royalty. Your grandfather played professional baseball in the Negro League. Correct me if I'm wrong, right? Uh, your dad yeah. played, your dad played, your brother played. Now, did you feel any pressure growing up that you had to follow in their footsteps? Uh, I, I never felt pressure. Uh, you know, my grandfather played in the Negro Leagues. He was the first black player to play for the Chicago White Sox. Uh, and then my uncle John actually played for the 69 Cubs before a knee injury ended his career. Uh, my uncle Sam also played professional baseball with the White Sox, but at that time he got called into the service. He had to go uh, uh, go to Vietnam. Uh, so that really derailed his baseball career. And then my father, uh, Jerry, played 14 years in the big leagues. You mentioned Scott, my brother, also played uh, uh, 10 years in the big leagues. And, you know, I can speak for Scott. We never felt pressure uh, playing the game. It's just basically all we kind of knew as kids. We were always around the baseball field, always going to, you know, old Comiskey Park. Uh, the new Comiskey Park, and we just wanted to be around our dad. And, you know, as a kid, I mean, that's probably the best thing. You know, you're three, four, five years of age, you pick up a, a, a bat and you want to hit a ball, you know. And just being around that environment, uh, we just loved it. And we took to it right away. Um, and we, we we just wanted to play. And then hearing our, our, our grandfather and our, our uncle and my dad, you know, tell stories, about their experiences. And you know, my grandfather played in, in the Negro Leagues, playing in Cuba before uh, the dictatorship, played in uh, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, Mexico, and, and playing in the big leagues. Hearing those experiences made us want to have experiences too. So uh, there was really no pressure. We just wanted to do it. Right, so it's just basically in the blood, bottom line. And your son, Jackson, is a great baseball player as well. I believe he's what, 15, 14 years old? He's, he's, he's 15. He's, he's 15. The freshman in high school, and and, and how much and, pressure? How much pressure are you putting on him to play major league baseball? <laughs> uh, I'm not putting any pressure on him. It's something that he wants to do. I've actually encouraged him to play other sports, uh, and he has. He played used to play basketball, but you know he said, "Hey, Dad, I want to focus on, on baseball," and, and that's what he wants to do. So I'm there to encourage him. Uh, he works hard. Uh, he definitely has more skill, especially hitting, uh, than I did at that age. Way better hitter than I was. He's a switch hitter. Uh, and he's going to be faster than me. So he definitely has the ability. I also have nephews, uh, Landon and Dallas, Scott's sons. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very good as well. And I have two younger daughters that play other sports, volleyball and, and, and uh, softball. So, you know, as fathers, we just want them to grow up to be a, a great people. And it's good that they have sports to kind of help them uh, develop. I, I always thought sports uh, it builds character. Uh, I think you need to fail in life uh, in order to succeed. And I don't care who you are, you're going to have failure in sports. Mm -hmm. And that definitely builds character, teamwork, camaraderie. Uh, and I have friends that are business people and they have their own companies. They always say, you know, when we try to hire people, we try to hire guys and women that have a sports background because they know how to work with te with teammates. Uh, and they're usually generally the, the harder workers. So I always thought that sports definitely builds character. I totally respect you as a as a dad because I follow you on Instagram and I see the workouts that you put your kids through. And it's just amazing to see that on, on, on my side because I'm not a father. But, you know, one day, you know. If, if, oh, if, if, what if, are you waiting for, Tony? <laughs> Pardon me? You're what are you waiting for? Time? Get on your horse. I, I love practicing. So you know, <laughs> one day I'll get there. But no, Jerry, I just really I commend you on that. Well, you know, people, I put workouts in on Instagram because there are fathers that hit me up on the DM mm -hmm. uh, and mothers and say, hey, I love these workouts. And they ask me questions and I, and I tell them, you know, certain workouts they can do with their kids. But the main thing I tell them is I make it fun. And that's what they want to do. 
you know, they asked me, hey, dad, can we go out and play catch? Can we hit? Can we throw? Uh, can we run routes? And I make it fun for them, you know, especially when they're young, man. You know, when they're eight, nine, ten years, I don't tell them anything. It's just fun. As they get older, then you can start to spe uh, be specific in certain workouts and kind of train them. But when they're young, especially in Little League, 12, 13, don't make it, you know, tedious. Make it fun. Let them go out there and develop a love for the game. You know, I think some parents uh, really emphasize you have to win, you have to win. Man, they need to go out and have fun. Mm -hmm. It's a yeah. game. And, and then as they get older, 15, 16, 17, then you can start to kind of train them a little bit. But you hit the you hit the nail on the head, Jerry. I think about sports and how important they can be in people's lives to build skills and good feeling about themselves. And uh, it's really great to hear you talk about your kids that way. I wondered if it would be. I mean, look. Of course, I know the answer is going to be yes, but I want you to elaborate on this. If your son went to the major leagues, and and that would mean he would be a fourth generation major leaguer, would yes. that be a, a particularly special thing to you in the lineage of your family? Um, it, it definitely would be special, but you know, now that my son has a passion for it, I would be happy for him. You know, this is his path. This is his journey. And that's the one thing everybody has their own path, their own journey. You know, what you are at 15 or 17 or 18 doesn't mean you're going to be like that at 21, 24, 25. There are a lot of great players. You know, you have guys that are, that are ranked at 16 years old or 18 years old and, and us that are big leaguers that have played a long time, we laugh at that. You know what I'm saying? Because I know a lot of guys who were great at 16 and did nothing in the big leagues. They were great in college and they did nothing when they got to the minor leagues in the big leagues. It's a journey, man. It's a process. You know, I remember hearing the story of Steph Curry. His dad wanted him to pursue golf because he didn't have any uh, offers to play uh, college basketball, nothing really major. He had more, he had better offers in, in golf to, to, to pursue that. And then he went to Davidson and he developed his skill because he got a little stronger, he got, a, he got a better shot. And look where he is right now because he continued on that journey. Damian, um, I think Damian Lillard went to Weber State, continued his journey. So there's a lot of big leaguers. Mitch, uh, uh, Mitch Moreland had, had, has an incredible story. You know, our guy McKinstry with the Dodgers. Didn't hit a home run in college. It was a 33rd round draft pick. He's one of the best guys now, I think, at putting the bat on the baseball. You know, so it's a journey. It's his journey. I always tell him, be better than me. Don't look at me. Be better than me because he can be better. You know, so I, I want that journey for him because that's that's his dream. But more importantly, man, if he becomes a firefighter, if he becomes a doctor, if he becomes whatever, a lawyer uh, or a mechanic, I want him to be a great citizen and a great father, a great husband. That's the most important thing. Jerry, I want to talk baseball with you. I, I spent a little time with you last year with Tony, and you told me some great stories. I want to share some of those stories with our audience. And the story, I'm a big Reds fan, huge Reds fan. I grew up in uh, Cincinnati, and I, I, I've been around the big red machine a lot. And you played for Cincinnati, and you told me this great story, which I repeat, about Ken Griffey and you playing together and you guys had an off day together, and why don't you take it from there? Uh, well, we actually, when you say off day, we were, we were playing. Uh, no, you, but, you, you guys were playing, but you guys had the day off. Your coach said. Exactly. We had, yeah, so I, yeah. I'll tell you, sir, the reason why we had the day off, I, I was playing a lot, uh, and I played 18 innings because my brother tied the game up in the ninth in San Diego, uh, and that made the game go into extra innings. We ended up playing 18 innings. So uh, Dusty Baker said, hey, man, we're, we go back. I know you're a little tired. I've been running you to the ground. I'm going to make sure you have an off day tomorrow in Cincinnati. Ken Griffey Jr., same thing. We're going to get him off his feet. And we were in Cincinnati playing uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates. And uh, Junior didn't even take BP. He's been, you know, he's a little older at this time. And he made sure he had a spa day. We would call it spa day. Just chill, uh, get a massage, get in the whirlpool. You're not going to do anything unless – you know, the game's tied. We have a chance to win late in the game. So Dusty Baker, it's around, I think it's the ninth inning. Uh, Dusty Baker said, hey, man, you might pinch it. Be ready to go. Tell Junior uh, he might pinch it as well. In fact, if they bring in Caps the righty, he's going to lead off, and then you're going to hit behind him. If they bring in the lefty, you're going to lead off, and then Junior would hit behind you. So I go and tell Junior. Junior has his 
has his uniform on, but he doesn't have his spikes. Hey, Junior, if they bring the caps, you're leading off. I said, all right, cool. Walks in, hasn't even stretched. He was just laying on the couch, ready to roll. Comes in, here comes Caps. I go, Junior, look in the tunnel. Junior, Caps is pitching, right? Gets up, has his uniform on. Put, at this time, he's at his spikes. Walks up the tunnel, goes right to the on-deck circle. You know what I'm saying? Right to the on-deck circle. I go in behind him. Starts, you know, getting the bat weight, bat weight like this. He doesn't even take a swing on the on-deck circle. All he's doing is make sure has the bat weight loosen up his shoulder. He goes up, before he goes up there, he slams the, uh, slams the, the bat weight down with his bat, looks at me. If he throws me, if he throws me a fastball, you're not hitting tonight. Walks up, first pitch was a ball, next pitch, walk off home run. It was a fastball. You know what I'm saying? That was so cool. I was on the end deck circle. You know, Michael Jordan, uh, Michael Jordan was obviously the greatest athlete of our era, probably ever. But Ken Griffey Jr., was the Michael Jordan of baseball. You know what I'm saying? He was every kid's hero. So to have Ken Griffey Jr. look at you and said, hey, I'm going to walk off right here. You ain't, you ain't going to have to hit. That was pretty cool. And for him to, 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 to do that, it was pretty special. Some guys are just built different. That, wow. built different. That's an incredible story. Jerry, I want to ask you about a, another player you played with because I am a huge Albert Bell fan. Um, and I understand he's a controversial guy. But I'm an Indians fan, you know, and watching him in Cleveland, it felt to me like I was watching like somebody like Mickey Mantle or something. It's just the things that he would do. So I wondered, um, you have some funny stories about Albert Bell from what I hear. And one hey, of them. Actually, Albert lives probably three miles from here. He what? Lives just, oh, yeah. He was three, three miles from here. Our daughters used to play soccer together. My, my daughters don't play soccer anymore. They've gone on to other sports. His daughters are very good at soccer. It's funny seeing him with his daughters. He has three. And he like melts because they're the princesses. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's kind of cool seeing him coach them and be around his, his daughters and his family. But I, I got a lot of uh, Albert Bell stories because he knew my father. He knew the history of my family. So he was a veteran guy, the highest paid player in Baltimore, really the highest paid player in baseball at the time when I was a rookie, you know, first two or three years in the big leagues. So um, I remember one time he goes, we're in Boston. Uh, he goes, Hey, uh, I'm going to take you to brunch before we go or lunch before we go to the stadium. I was like, cool. And when Albert Bell tells you to do that, you're going, you know what I'm saying? So we go out to, we go out to lunch and, you know, we eat and start talking. He's talking to me about hitting, you know, Hey man, you're hitting second now, you know, make sure you get on base. You don't just work the count, get guys over, you know, help me out, which is true. And he hit uh, third, a lot of times, sometimes fourth. And after we're done, you know, eating the check comes, and he passes the check to me. Now remember, I'm I'm making the league minimum, which is probably around 250 at the time. You know what I'm saying? He's making 12, 13 million a year. He was the highest paid baseball player. So I pick up the check and I throw it at him. You know what I'm saying? He starts laughing. You know, and he's like, "Don't you ever make me pick up a check?" Because I knew that, you know, obviously, yeah, uh, veterans always pick up the check. But one thing I didn't have to do as a rookie, I always had to make sure whether it's at home or on the road, I have to make sure he had his coffee whether it's starbucks or whatever he had to have a coffee in his locker before he got oh, wow. to the stadium so uh if I, if we were going to the stadium together i would have it for him before we got on in the car or if we weren't riding together i had to make sure i was early to make sure his coffee was there just respect you know from the young guy and you know to the veteran but the one thing i will say you loved him on your team man he came to play every single day. And I remember uh, we were in Minnesota and I was, you know, hitting seventh, eighth, but I started swinging the bat really well. Uh, he had told the manager and Cal Ripken had told him the manager too, Hey, we need to put Jerry up in the order because he's getting on base. He's got speed. Uh, they had Brady lead off and I hit second. Uh, and he told me you hit second tonight. I go, yeah. He goes, get on base. And just walked away. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was like, I better get on base tonight. I had like 19 pitch at bats, working the walk, got some singles. You know what I'm saying? And he had two home, two home runs that night. So he was a great teammate. Loved playing with him. And he always thought he had the best arm in right field in the history of the game, which was wrong. He called his arm Bazooka Joe. Wow. <laughs> but he was decent outfielder. No, I, I, I'm a Jerry. I'm a prank guy. I love doing pranks on people. I'm known for pranks. 
And you pulled off a pretty good prank in Texas when you were playing for the Rangers. Do you mind telling our audience about that with your with your catcher? Um, I, I I appreciate a great prank. I want to hear it from you. Wow, this is I've had this question asked of me in, in quite some time. So this is Ross the boss does his research. I do research. I'm ready for interviews so, here. Like we all ready here. We're ready to roll. So Gerald Laird at the time, who's a catcher, Laird went on to have a really good career. Uh, Gerald Laird was a rookie, and I had always worn 15. You know, and he was there, obviously there before I was, before I got traded over there. So he got 15 and a lot of guys were telling, hey, give the number to Jerry. You know what I'm saying? I never asked for it. I always said, hey, I know you're you're newly married. You have a kid on the way. You know, I'll give you money for it or take, you know, whatever gift you want to give your wife, whatever. I'll give you whatever you want for that number. He said, Jerry, 15 is my lucky number. I want to work 15. I want to have it. So for a couple of weeks, I tried to, you know, wrestle away 15 from him and he, and he refused, which was fine. But then he started getting chirpy a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Started talking back and guys going, you're going to take that Jay hair. You're going to take that. So I was like, okay. He starts saying a lot of different stuff in a joking way. I go, bro, you're a rookie. Slow your roll. So what I did, I took my time. I said, how can I get this rookie back? Cause this is his first year. He's going to break with the club. So in Arizona, you know, we're in spring training. I know a lot of police officers here that are huge baseball fans that are anxious to play some pranks on baseball players. So what I did was I did my research. I found out where he went to high school in California. I found out one of the prettier girls that was in his high school class. So I decided to uh, make up a story that he had owed um, child support dating back eight, nine years. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I had the police officers come on a Sunday that they were leaving to go from Surprise, Arizona to Texas, where he, we were going to break, start the season. I had them come in our clubhouse and arrest him. And they had to expedite him to the, to the board of California and where the California uh, officers would, would take him into custody. So they come in our clubhouse, they arrest him. A couple of my police officers, their friends, they start yelling at him, hey, pack your stuff. You think we want to be here on our day off? We have to We have to get you, you deadbeat dad. And everybody's kind of like, oh, my God, scared. So so Gerald's like, we have his mug shot, or they have his picture of him. Is this you? Picture? He goes, he goes, yeah. He goes, do you know this woman here? <laughs> and we're like, Gerald, shut up. He goes, yeah. <laughs> he admitted he knew the woman. He goes, they knew the girl from his high school. You know what I'm saying? He goes, she says you owe blah, 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 back child support. And he's like, and he's thinking in his mind, maybe I do, you know what I'm oh. saying? Because the officers were so convincing. He got handcuffed. Uh, one of our teammates threw him a towel. The cameras are there because we're, we're, we're leaving to go to Texas. So all the reporters from Dallas are, are there to, to view our trip back to, to Dallas, Texas. They're videoing him. They, they have this towel. He's like this, hiding. They put him in the squad car. The officers are going, they're, they're saying, you're such a deadbeat. I have kids. I would never do that. The officers were great, man. You couldn't find better actors than them. That's wrong. I get in the squad car with him. I go, listen, bro, Gerald, I have a really good lawyer. I'm good friends with in California. He'll help you out. Here's his number. He turns to me almost in tears. He goes, Jerry, I don't know what I'm going to do. My wife is going to kill me. Oh. So I go, hey, bro, don't ever mess with me again. All of oh. And he goes, you got to be kidding me. That's we got awesome. it on video somewhere. somewhere has it, somebody has it on video. Oh, that's, uh, oh that, I mean, that's a great. Did your manager know about that? I mean, the, of course, the manager was in on it. Okay. Our GM, John Daniels, was in on it. Everybody was in on it. They they loved it. They, so, they, they loved it. So at that point, you know, so, so at that at that point in your career, did you know right then that you wanted to work in television after that? Or did you know beforehand? And how did your job with the Dodgers come to fruition? OK, you know, when I wanted to work on television when I was eight years old, uh, my dad played for the Chicago White Sox at that time. Mm -hmm. They had two broadcasters who did the game, Ken Hall Carlson and Don Drysdale. So I remember being on the bus uh, going to the Brewers. The Brewers were in the American League at the time. My dad was with the White Sox. So I remember uh, I sat next to a guy who, you know, I listened to and watch on TV talk about the White Sox game. Uh, and he's, he was telling me his story. I go, hey, I really like watching on TV. You're a great broadcaster. I learned a lot. He goes, well, I used to be a player. He's like, and I was like, what? You played? And he goes, yeah. You know, and obviously I didn't know the history of Don Drysdale. 
know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then I went back, did research, and I figured out Don Drysdale was a great player back in the day, you know? And I said, that's what I want to do. I want to be a Major League Baseball player, and then when I'm done playing, I want to talk about baseball. Wow. So Don Drysdale gave me that vision of, hey, I can be a baseball player, but then when I'm done playing, I can talk about baseball. I mean, what's better than that? You know exactly. what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's just kind of cool that the guy that got me in a broadcaster or at least gave me that vision was Don Drysdale. And now I, I cover the Dodgers of the team that he uh, obviously uh, had a hall of fame career with. And that's, that's pretty cool. Right. I love watching you every night on uh, spectrum sports net. Correct. And yes. one thing I really love is you always wear these really nice suits, but then again, I know your passion for Jordan. You have the nicest Jordans on every night. So yeah. And can you tell people about your past? Because I know you used to play basketball in high school. Yes. And, and I think you thought that you could have been a professional ba basketball player. Am I right or wrong? Well, I definitely had the confidence mm -hmm. to be an NBA player. I had the confidence. Did I have the skill set? Probably not. Uh, I love basketball. Uh, I grew up in Chicago. Uh, obviously, baseball is my first love. Right. Uh, but basketball, growing up, watching Michael Jordan play every night, work hard, Scottie Pippen, that Bulls team, uh, I developed a huge passion for basketball. Mm -hmm. and, and to get back to the shoes, the reason why I wear the Jordans is because I'm standing now because of COVID. Right. And now that I'm standing, I'm sometimes I'm standing, you know, an hour at a time, hour and a half, depending. Uh, so I want to be comfortable. And a lot of fans said, hey, why are you wearing dress shoes? This is baseball. You know what I'm saying? You need to be have comfortable shoes. So I say, you know, I'll wear a couple Jordans, see what happens. And fans just love it. I get hit up all the time on Twitter. They go, man, I love your Jordans. I love, I love the threes. I love the fives. I love the 11s. So it's become kind of cool where the fans uh, sometimes watch and you find out what I'm wearing, you know, that, that, that day. No, a, lot of, a lot of baseball fans, you know, a lot of Dodger fans are Laker fans. A lot of Laker fans obviously love Kobe. Right. And if you love Kobe, you also love his hero. Kobe's hero is Michael Jordan. So there's a huge correlation between Kobe and Jordan because they were practically the same player, you mm -hmm. know, built from the same cloth, you know, so I should say cut from the same cloth. So um, I have tremendous respect for Kobe Bryant. You know, he was the closest thing to Jordan um, and, you know, just the way he played the game. So, you know, wearing uh, uh, Jordans on air, uh, I'm going to continue that, but I'm also going to eventually wear a little bit, a little bit of Kobe's too. Uh, and, you know, I know Kyrie Irvin a little bit. Uh, Kyrie, Kyrie's going to be sending me some of his shoes, too. Uh, I know his, his uh, manager uh, really well. Uh, she's going to be sending me some of the uh, Kyrie, so I'm going to be wearing them as well. So it's, it's become pretty cool. How about a pair of Shaq's? No. Shaq's? <laughs> I wear size 11. Shaq, what, I think Shaq was size, what, 24? Yeah, so, I, was, I was just teasing with you there. So, Jerry, Jordan was a huge hero of yours and a huge hero of so many people, including myself. Who would you say was your, your baseball hero? Well, it has to start with my dad. Right. You know, my dad was my, my baseball hero. Uh, just the way he went about his business, you know, he never was gifted or given anything. He worked for everything he's gotten uh, in, in life. Uh, but he's a guy that I always admired. You know, uh, he was a great father, always took the time out um, to, you know, be a father. You know, he was a father first and um, he took that uh, responsibility and made sure that, you know, he was dad and we got time, even though he was busy, you know. And obviously, as I got a little older, I understood how busy, you know, he was, you know. Uh, but, you know, my dad was my, my first baseball hero, but I, I loved a lot of players, man. Ken Griffey Jr. was probably my favorite player growing up. Uh, just his style, the way he played the game, uh, unique. You know, you see guys like Tatis Jr. now. Mm -hmm. You see, you know, Mookie Betts, their style, their swag. Well, that was Ken Griffey Jr. when I was a kid. You know, when he burst on the scene, he was electric, man. Um, and then I grew up watching, you know, Kyle Griffey Jr., the way he played the game, Kirby Puckett, who's a Chicago kid that I admired. And Robert Alomar was, was unbelievable, too. So, you know, I was very fortunate. There were so many guys that played the game the right way that were great players that I admired. Right. Now, do you think that Tatis has the most athleticism in baseball now or Mookie? Ooh. Uh, 
man, guys, you know, Tatis is 6'3", mm-hmm. 220, runs like a deer, would play, could play any sport. He could be a basketball player if he wanted to. He could be a wide receiver. Really, he'd be a strong safety in football. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's one of the most gifted athletes in the game. Uh, you can make a case Tatis is the best athlete in the world right now in any sport. Wow. Uh, Mookie Betts is right there. Yes. If you go watch Mookie Betts' Instagram, he works out like a basketball player. Right. He bowls 300 games, an incredible bowler, incredible golfer, and he doesn't play a whole lot of golf. Right. I, I go, I play this course here all the time in DC Ranch, here right down the street. One of the toughest courses in the country. He shot a 79. I mean, like, he doesn't play that course. Right. He's like, well, are you kidding me? I got ticked when I heard that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, just a gifted athlete and, and could run touchdowns if he was a kickoff return. Yeah. Be a wide receiver in football. I, I, incredible athlete. So those two guys, along with Mike Trout, I would say not just baseball players. They're, they're the three best athletes on the planet right now. They can do everything. Catch, hit, throw, mm-hmm. run, mm-hmm. jump. You know, I mean, you put them on a basketball court, they'll hit a three-pointer. Right. They're just as quick at the ba- as the basketball players. They won't be lost in an NBA game. But you take a guy who plays the NBA, like Kevin Durant, who's unbelievable, probably the best basketball player in the world, or LeBron James, you put him in, in, in the batter's box, how are they going to do? You take a wide receiver – you know, in, in football, uh, how are they going to do in the batter's box? You know what I'm saying? So that's why I say baseball players, they got to be a quarterback. They got to be a wide receiver. Mm-hmm. They got to be the skill set of a golfer hitting 95, 98 in the batter's box. Baseball players are the best athletes in the world. I totally agree with you. So, Jerry, on that point, I just want to thank you for coming on our show. Um, I know you have to go and just it's been an honor to um you know, know you over these years and, and see your progression after baseball and uh, just wish you more continued success and to your kids as well. And I just want to say, I respect you for being a great father. Also. I love that. Tom, Tony, listen, me and you have developed a great friendship and, and mm-hmm. all you guys, you know, but I've known Tony longer and what you've done with your career, uh, especially as an actor, you continue to grow uh, it's been a privilege to see it and watch. And you're one of the most humble guys uh, I've ever been around. That's why guys like Ken Griffey Jr. love you. You know, that's why uh, you get so much love from past baseball players, but also mm-hmm. current baseball players, because your passion uh, for the skill of baseball is really unmatched, man. So uh, continue success, man. Yeah. And whenever you need me, hit me up. OK, well, thank you. It's just like my mom said, just treat people the way you want to be treated and no one's above common courtesy and uh, we're out. Thank you. Anytime. Thanks, Jerry.